Warlocks in D&D borrow, steal, and deal their powers from the strongest beings in the multiverse. Let's conjure up our own mystical mage. Not just anyone has the guile to siphon magic from such powerful patrons, so warlocks tend to prize their charisma more than any other ability score. From there, a good constitution score will probably serve you well to help maintain concentration on spells, and you may also want a decent wisdom and intelligence score to aid in your saving throws against spells from those hardworking wizard nerds. In the end, you'll probably care less about your dexterity score, but some builds may want to prioritize this if you plan on making a sword swinger instead of a spell slinger. But you'll definitely want to dump your strength score, because if your warlock doesn't even work for their own magic, they definitely aren't hitting the gym. That said, your warlock can really be any species, since ability score boosts are now tied to your background, but this does mean we'll want to carefully consider which of those we want to take. In most cases, you'll probably want to pick up the merchant background to help boost your charisma and constitution with a decent narrative run-up for the CD connections you'll be making in your line of work. The player's handbook does say you can also ignore the narrative flavor for background, so you could always take something like Entertainer if you want the extremely powerful musician origin feat, or Hermit if you're making a lawful good simp for some divine deity. God is a woman! <laughs> Oh, and she's hot. Just be careful not to slide into any DMs. Ew. Starting out in Warlock, we'll get a D8 hit die and 8 plus our constitution modifier in starting hit points, proficiency in wisdom and charisma saving throws, simple weapons, light armor, and any two skills out of Arcana, Deception, History, Intimidation, Investigation, Nature, and Religion. More importantly, we'll make our first foray into the mystical arts as we get our pack magic feature along with two cantrips, two level one spells, and one very lonely spell slot to use with them that refreshes on a short rest instead of a long rest like other casters. <laughs> What's wrong? My spell slots are all alone, just like me! I'm here for you. <laughs> so alone! We'll be using charisma as our main spell casting ability, so our spell attack rolls will be our charisma modifier plus our proficiency bonus, and our spell save DC will be that plus eight. Then as you level, you'll get more spells, spell slots, and spell slot levels according to this chart. Warlocks are sort of known for this catch 22 of having less spell slots with the ability to recharge more quickly, but the spell slots themselves actually scale together as you level. This means that you'll always have the highest possible spell slot ready for casting powerful magic, but it also means that you'll want to be pretty choosy about the spells you do take. You can only swap one spell and one cantrip each time you gain a Warlock level, and some of the options on the Warlock spell list can't be upcast. Trust me, you do not want to get stuck burning a 5th level spell slot on Speak With Animals. Listen here, you beast of burden! You're going to give us a ride to wherever we please, and you're going to be happy about it, okay? Um... Nay. This is also why I find it important to invest in Constitution for most Warlock builds. When picking spells for your limited spell slots, you're often going to be looking for options that stick around for a while, and many of those will require concentration. Some good options for cantrips and spells at this stage include Eldritch Blast because duh, Hex for some nice extra damage on each of our attacks, Witch Bolt for a decent burst option that then deals damage as a bonus action on subsequent turns, and Tasha's Hideous Laughter for some incredibly impactful battlefield control that scales pretty well with upcasting. Although this isn't all we're going to get at level 1. We'll also unlock our first Eldritch Invocation at this stage, and there are a ton of unique options here that offer a lot of customization for your character right off the bat. I'm not going to cover all of them right now, but I'll be sure to post a video in the future that does. You'll probably want to at least consider the Pact options on this list, like Pact of the Blade, Pact of the Chain, and Pact of the Tome. Each of these serves different types of Warlock builds particularly well, and are probably too powerful to ignore for other options. After all, as we move to level 2, we'll be presented with two more invocations, and we'll be able to perform a one minute ritual once per long rest to recover half of our max spell slots rounded up. Please, Magic Daddy, please! I really, really want it! Please! Fine.
You ungrateful little shit. While this doesn't seem like much, it'll effectively double our spell slots at this stage, and it'll certainly come in handy in situations down the road when we don't have time to short rest and beg for our patron to give us all of our slots back. Then, once we're drunk on their power, our patron will rope us into their MLM cult at third level, and we'll take our warlock subclass officially. A lot of players have voiced their dislike for the flavor of taking your warlock subclass this late, but I actually like it. Up to this point, it feels like our patron may have been giving us a small taste of power, suckling on their teeth, getting us addicted to their magical milk. <laughs> Kinda like the first few minutes of this video before I drop that absolutely unhinged analogy. If you plan it out with your DM, taking your subclass can even feel like playing through your warlock's backstory a bit adding to the flavor that's already so intense with this class. So you may even want to have some idea of what subclass you want to take all the way back at level one, even if that isn't entirely necessary. There are four options to choose from in the 2024 Player's Handbook, or we can take any of the options released since 2014 that haven't been reprinted. For simplicity, let's take a look at the new ones, which will all grant features at third, sixth, 10th and 14th levels. Oh, but of course you can use my power. It'll be like the child I never had. Ah, oh, thank I'll you. I'll be one of yours. What? Archfey Warlocks draw their magic from the Feywild for all kinds of tricky antics, starting when you take the subclass with extra prepared spells, including Fairy Fire, Blink, greater invisibility, and dominate person. Here, you'll also attain teleports galore with free castings of Misty Step, Charisma Modifier Times, per long rest. And what's more, you'll get additional effects anytime you cast the spell, like 1d10 temporary hit points for yourself or a creature you can see within 10 feet, or you can force creatures within five feet of the space you leave to have disadvantage on attack rolls against others pending a wisdom save. At sixth level, the Misty Step intensifies as you can cast the spell as a reaction to taking damage and unlock even more effects to choose from when you cast it. You can gain the invisible condition until the start of your next turn, or until you attack, deal damage, or cast a spell, or you can even deal 2d10 psychic damage to creatures within five feet of the space you left or the space you appear in against a wisdom save. Later on, you'll become outright immune to the charmed condition, and you'll gain a new reaction that you can trigger once per long rest, unless you burn a packed magic spell slot to restore it. This new effect allows you to cut the damage of an attack on you by half, round it down, and then force the attacker to make a wisdom save against taking that same amount of damage in psychic form. Then, at level 14, the Misty Step intensifies even further as your Feywild patron allows you to cast the spell for free anytime you cast an enchantment or illusion spell with your action and a spell slot. This casting doesn't require a bonus action from you and serves, I think, as an appropriate reward for investing in spells that cause mischief everywhere you go. This subclass is fantastically fun, and I've actually already seen it in action during one of our live play campaigns, so feel free to check it out for yourself if you're thinking about mistying your step. You have proven yourself worthy, mortal. Become a cleric in my name. Ew. Boring! <laughs> Fine. Be my warlock? Sounds edgy. I'll subscribe to that, and you should too. As you can probably guess, celestial warlocks get their power from the heavens of the upper plains and bring a somewhat uncharacteristically bright flavor to the base class. This connection to the divine nets us spells like Aid, Revivify, Guardian of Faith, and Greater Restoration, to name a few, along with a pretty nifty way to heal our allies without burning our spell slots. Using a pool of d6s equal to 1 plus your warlock level, you can heal yourself or one creature you can see within 60 feet with your bonus action. This pool of dice replenishes when you long rest, and while the number of dice you can roll with this feature is capped by your charisma modifier, that's still a pretty nifty way to keep your allies up. After all, it's basically healing word, and that's pretty much the best healing spell in the game. 
Level 6 grants you resistance to radiant damage and the ability to add your charisma modifier to the damage against one target of a spell you cast that deals radiant and fire damage. From there, you'll get temporary hit points equal to your warlock level and charisma modifier anytime you finish a short or long rest or use your magical cunning ritual from second level. And then level 14 allows you to restore a fallen ally within 60 feet to half their maximum hit points and have them stand up from prone when they're about to make a death saving throw. Additionally, each creature of your choice within 30 feet of them takes 2d8 plus your charisma modifier in radiant damage and is blinded until the end of the current turn. While this feature is only usable once per long rest, it doesn't even use your reaction and it's bound to come in handy during high level campaigns when the tank goes down surrounded by a horde of vulnerable minions. This subclass is probably my least favorite of the bunch due to its lack of typical warlock flavor, but that isn't to say it's bad, and it's great at turning your eldritch sad boy into the party healer, or at least a really solid backup if you still want to build out the rest of your character as normal. So in summary, you'll get fireball and I'll get your soul. Done. You don't want to hear the rest. What was that? A warlock serving the fiend patron often plays out exactly as you'd expect, by making a deal with an evil entity for all the fiery powers of the lower planes. You'll get always prepared spells including Scorching Ray, Fireball, Fire Shield, and Insect Plague. But you'll also be able to gain temporary hit points equal to your charisma modifier and warlock level anytime you reduce an enemy to zero hit points or someone else does so to an enemy within 10 feet of you. At sixth level, you can add 1d10 to any ability check or saving throw you make charisma modifier times per long rest so you never fail anything too important again. And 10th level grants you resistance to any damage type other than force when you finish a short or long rest until you choose a new type the next time. Eventually, you can even send a creature flying through the nine hells when you hit them with an attack roll. They'll first need to fail a charisma saving throw, but then they'll disappear, take 8d10 psychic damage if they aren't a fiend, and become incapacitated until the end of your next turn, when they suddenly reappear in their space, having witnessed the horrors of your patron's domain. <laughs> what was that? Oh! <laughs> Sorry, my patron's the god of thoughts, actually. You can only do this once per turn and once per long rest unless you burn a pact magic spell slot to refresh it, but the flavor is undeniably cool. Even if you never see 14th level, the early temporary HP and boost to your vital ability checks and saves is more than worth the price that you'll pay. Lose yourself to the void and expand your mind to the bounds of reality. Oh no, you're just here for the kinky tentacle stuff, aren't you? Don't forget the goo, please. Great Old One Warlocks get their magic from the chaotic and unknowable forces of the Far Realm, bestowing them with flavorful, always prepared spells like Dissonant Whispers, Tasha's Hideous Laughter, Hunger of Hadar, and Summon Aberration. Then, as a bonus action, you can open a link with a creature within 30 feet and speak telepathically back and forth over a number of miles equal to your charisma modifier. While this connection only lasts a number of minutes equal to your warlock level and ends early if you use this feature to connect to another creature, Creature, there's no limit on how many times you can do this, there's no saving throw against it for your enemies, and it's still not all you get at level 3. You'll also be able to change the damage of your warlock spells into psychic damage, which is a pretty excellent damage type that's rarely resisted, and you won't even have to use verbal or somatic components for your warlock illusion and enchantment spells. Shortly after, at level 6, your telepathy feature can then force a creature to make a wisdom save or take disadvantage on attack rolls against you while you have advantage against them for the duration of the bond. You can only use this feature once per short rest unless you burn a packed magic spell slot to refresh it, but the effect is pretty decent so long as your enemy fails the save, and we'll be able to hedge our bets on this at level 10 with Eldritch Hex. This feature makes it so that we always have the Hex spell prepared and when we cast Hex and choose an ability, the target also has disadvantage on saving throws of the chosen ability. You'll also become immune to having your thoughts read unless you allow it, and gain resistance to psychic damage. Even further, you can reflect the psychic damage that you do take back onto the creature that hit you. 
Then at level 14, you'll be able to create a thrall to do your bidding by casting the Summon Aberration spell without concentrating on it. The spell then only lasts for one minute instead of one hour, but it gets a lot more powerful. The Aberration will have temporary hit points equal to your Warlock level plus your Charisma modifier, and the first time the Aberration hits a creature under the effect of your Hex, it'll deal extra psychic damage to the target equal to the bonus damage of the Hex. This subclass's impeccable flavor and power are sure to make it a staple at many tables, although truly you can't go wrong with any of them as we move on to level four, where you'll get your first feat. Here you can choose to take an ability score improvement or another feat, just as you can at Warlock levels eight, 12, and 16. Then at level five, we'll get access to two more invocations and our two spell slots will jump to level three. That is, if your patron isn't sick of your shit by now. Money, please! Oh, no, no, there's no money. Money, please! Money, please. You'll probably want to consider invocations like Agonizing Blast for extra Warlock cantrip damage, Devil's Sight so you can see in both non-magical and magical darkness, Lessons of the First Ones for an extra origin feat of your choice, and Misty Visions for some endless illusory shenanigans. In particular, veterans should keep in mind that invocations like Agonizing Blast can now be applied to any Warlock cantrip, not just Eldritch Blast. So, even if Eldritch Blast is still the best option in most cases. There may be something better for you depending on your build. As for spells at this point, make sure to check out Hold Person, Hypnotic Pattern, Hunger of Hadar, and Summon Fey. Note that most of these options do last for a while and come with upcasting for later. The other one is Hypnotic Pattern and that spell is just crazy good regardless of its lack of upcasting. And all the way at level nine, we'll get another Warlock feature that allows us to contact our patron directly via the Contact Other Plane spell. Here you'll always have that spell prepared and you can cast it without expending a spell slot once per long rest automatically succeeding the saving throw not to have your brain scrambled in the process. This means you can ask your patron five free questions every day and hopefully squeeze out some juicy lore secrets about your campaign. Or maybe just bug the crap out of your DM when they don't feel like role-playing your sugar daddy. So, what's your favorite color? Uh, green? Write that down, write that down! <laughs> also at this level, we'll have earned a couple more invocations and our spell slots will jump to level five, which is actually as high as they'll ever get. Most of the invocations we unlock at this level extend the use of our base packed invocations, so you'll probably want to prioritize those and you'll also want to consider taking spells like Banishment, Hold Monster, Synaptic Static, and Planar Binding, many of which can outright end some combats before they even begin. Now to address the Cthulhu in the room. While it's true that your spell slots will only grow to level five, you will get access to higher level spells. At level 11, we'll get our first round of Mystic Arcanum. Here, we'll choose one sixth level spell that we can cast once per long rest without expending a spell slot. We'll then get a seventh level spell to use this way at 13th level, eighth level spell at 15th level, and a ninth level spell at 17th level. And just like our other spells, we can only swap these out when we gain a Warlock level. But in this case, the swap spell must be of the same level. So we'll wanna be even more careful about what we pick here. My own personal favorite options would be Tasha's Bubbling Cauldron, Force Cage, Befuddlement, and Foresight. But what you pick can largely depend on both your campaign and how sessions tend to run at your table. Like if your DM never gives you potions of healing, perhaps. Keeping that in mind, at 19th level, we'll get to select one of the extremely powerful epic boon feats instead of just a normal one. And then, at level 20, when we conduct our magical cunning ritual over a minute, we'll regain all of our expended pack magic spell slots instead of just half. Wow, I almost one, can't count them two, on one hand. Three, um... In all seriousness, this capstone is probably the biggest letdown of the whole class, and I definitely see quite a few reasons to multi-class out before this stage if the opportunity arises. However, I don't think the important part of Warlock is actually the spells. Warlock is a class that's all about customization, and there are a lot of different ways to play it depending on which Eldritch invocations you take. If you'd like to customize yourself a little bit, check out our friends over at Tabletop Beard who make some amazing beard care products that are themed to different classes, including the Warlock. 
They are not sponsoring this video, but they are great friends of ours, and that discount code gives us a little bit of a kickback as well. So if you'd like to support our friends and support the channel at the same time, be sure to check out Tabletop Beard's awesome beard care products. And until next time, go out there and make some chaos.